nice to have some uh, barbecue weather for our barbecue. Um, you might have noticed that I'm not Martin. <laughs> Just thought I might point that out for you in case you thought I might have been Martin. I'm not. But um, this morning what we're looking at is making the convention work in practice. And Gabor is going to start us off this morning by talking about monitoring the CRPG and the work of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, as you're aware from Gabor's previous introductions, Gabor was one of the um, original members of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with, it, with Disabilities. So I'm sure what Gabor has to share with us today will be very enlightening about the work of the Committee. Gabor. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really moving that after the party last night, so many of us are already here in this room. And uh, let me start with saying that today you will be able to see all the weaknesses of my presentation skills. I uh, prepared with a PowerPoint, which is not my strength. It is a very simple PowerPoint, no colors, no shapes, no whatsoever. I wanted to have one diagram, but I failed to figure out how to copy and paste what my absolutely brand new uh, tablet. So I will use again the flip chart and I will try to draw what was supposed to be on the uh, slides. Uh, I also took a somewhat liberal interpretation of uh, the title of my presentation. Yes, I will talk mostly about the work of the committee, but I thought that it's really important to put uh, the committee's monitoring work in a broader context. And I hope that you will see by the end of my presentation that why I think it is important. So I will not restrict myself to the monitoring made by the uh, Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but to some extent I will go a little bit beyond it because what I also changed the title a little bit uh, making monitoring meaningful. Um, and I have to acknowledge uh, my colleagues and friends Amita's help. I was struggling uh, in my preparation to this uh, lecture. Being active participant of a work has obvious advantages, but it has disadvantages also. I was lost uh, in uh, all my experience and the knowledge I gathered during the years in the committee and I simply didn't find a logical and didactic way to give a sequence and the sequence is not only about the form of the presentation, the sequence decides what argumentation you can make. So thank you for uh, the contribution and let's jump into the middle. And I promise that I will not use this one, but I discovered that I have to see what slides I have, otherwise I can be lost. So first I want to address the very basic question, why do we need monitoring? Uh, it seems to be obvious, but frankly, when uh, I saw my own country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, how they prepared the country reports, not for the CRPD committee, because obviously there is a conflict of interest there, but to other committees like the Committee on the Rights of the Child or uh, the CEDO committee, then I saw that uh, for the administration very often it is just a work to do. Uh, it's a duty, like a homework, and they do not put it into any context. They simply do not see a real meaning of this. Now we are advocates, I think, at least I approach this theme from an advocate's perspective. Why do we think that monitoring is necessary? And I submit three reasons for this. First of all, when countries ratify a treaty, they may have a number of reasons. And let me again start with my country. Hungary is one of the countries which likes ratifying most 
of the treaties. Because we think it is an important thing to do, it is good to be part of the international community, also in the field of human rights. And by ratifying this treaty, they commit themselves to something. But it's not entirely clear to what. So if it is only the Ratification Act, then Hungary would implement some of their obligations under the treaties and will forget about some others. So self-compliance is inadequate. I have to tell you that there are huge differences uh, between countries in that respect. There are countries who, before they go for the ratification, really deeply look into what really the uh, obligations mean for them. And before the ratifications, either they try to bring their domestic laws and policies in compliance with the treaty, or at least to have a clear picture what they are supposed to do uh, in the future after the ratification. Why there are other countries who ratify and then uh, after the ratification they realize what is their duty, what they have to do, and then step by step, especially when they are reminded and politely but uh, consistently warned that they have some duties and they are not compliant yet, they implement uh, their obligations. Another important reason why I think that uh, monitoring is really necessary is that we want to achieve systemic change. We do not want to make cosmetic changes. We do not want to pick up some areas and fix them while keep the rest of the issues unchanged. In order to be able to make systemic changes, everyone needs to understand what are the systemic problems. And it's not an easy thing. For governments and policymakers, but I would say very often for NGOs, including DPOs, who work in that particular country, who experience the system from inside, it is a situation when you are surrounded by so many trees that from the trees you can't see the wood. If there is another entity, another watchdog, if you like, who looks at the same structure, the same system from the outside, then they clearly see that there is a wood there. They see the shape, they see the major patterns. Of course, their weakness is that they don't really see the individual trees. They have no idea how the trees look like, that one tree is different from the other, etc., etc. The two picture together, I think, gives a much better understanding and knowledge about both the systemic uh, problems, the systemic strength as well the weaknesses, to identify from a bird's eyes view where in the wood trees are very unhealthy and where are trees which are very, very uh, capable of, of growth. But this knowledge needs to be combined with the knowledge of the individual trees. And if both are in place, then I think we have everything what is required for systemic changes. Of course, political will, resources, and other things may be also required. And this leads us to the third uh, reason, which I mentioned on this slide, namely that monitoring by an external body provides space for external guidance. And let me tell you the very first story, because this presentation, unlike my earlier one on legal capacity, is not going to be overly interactive. I hope it will not be overly boring either. Uh, I try to make it more interesting through sharing some of the stories, which are real stories, uh, from my experience in the committee. The very first country the CRPD committee had the privilege to review was Tunisia. 
And it was a few months after the Libya revolution. And it was amazing. Frankly, I believed, and I was not the only member of the committee, who strongly believed that in the last minute, the government, the brand new government of Tunisia, will request us to postpone this review, and we would have understood it. We would have no issue about it. Now, they didn't do so. They came, and they didn't know what some other countries, including mine, would have done in a similar situation. A brand new government is coming. They are faced non-compliance on a number of areas with their international human rights law obligations. But obviously, that government, the brand new government, has very little to do with those mistakes which were made in the past. It's a very easy answer. Yes, but it was done by the previous regime. And in Tunisia, it was not simply a government change, it was a systemic change. And they didn't know that. They acknowledged, they didn't blame the previous regime, uh, and they made, they promised that they will make efforts to uh, change the situation in a systemic manner. And I have to tell you that in certain areas, what Tunisia has done uh, regarding the rights of persons with disabilities since then is amazing. Um, so, when we adopted the concluding observations on Tunisia, which consists of concerns and recommendations, then several Tunisian NGOs and also diplomats and people from the government came to us and told us that it's great because the recommendations which the committee made as an outcome of the country review can be used as uh, a skeleton for a disability action plan, a Tunisian National Disability Action Plan. So they understood, and I think that many of us in the committee understood through this, that yes, this external guidance can be enormously useful. Of course, only when the recommendations are properly tailored, and I think I will come back to what it means. Uh, I do not want to pretend that uh, treaty body monitoring, including the CRPD work, is perfect. It's pa far from perfect. And if you ask people, if you go to the grassroots, if you go to persons with disabilities in your country, in your city, in your village, uh, if you read some of them who are not even members of any DPOs, very likely they have never heard about the CRPD. They have never heard about a committee in Geneva. They have no idea about it. They have heard about the UN. I don't know whether they heard good things about it or bad things, most likely both. But I don't expect that they have much expectation about what the UN can do for them. Now, if you go to a more organized membership of DPOs, then the situation slightly changes. They may have more information. They might have heard about the convention. They might have even heard about what rights uh, persons with disabilities have under this convention. They might have even heard about the existence of such a committee, but uh, at the level of, uh, I would say, affections, their opinion is not that much different. Uh, they have little trust in that. And if you go to the elite of the national disability movements, then still, I think, very often, you will find skepticism. You will find, I would even say, established skepticism about what such a thing as the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities can really do for people with disabilities in the country. So I put together again three. Three is a magical number. In most tales, folk tales, you have three and seven things. Uh, one of the often complaints or concerns is the Geneva is far away. It's too far. 
they do something we don't really know what they do and they are too far from us they don't really know what life is here on the ground better educated people will say that yeah they are working hard but very little result can be really expected from that because in international human rights law, there is no teeth, there is no such a thing as informants mechanisms. They come up with recommendations, but they cannot be really enforced. So what is the meaning of having concluding observations then? And then I heard it from many countries, especially smaller countries, and being a smaller country does not necessarily mean geographic size or population size. It means not having a very high power within international political systems, including the United Nations. So they very often complain that what really happens around this entire human rights monitoring internationally is that the strong countries blame the weak they present them as the bad ones who violate human rights of people, including human rights of persons with disabilities. And they have the potential and the power doing that. And what is the real motivation behind it? My opinion is that it's not a self-goal that they want to blame the small ones, the less powerful ones. It is that they do not want to show their own human rights violations, the systemic ones, which happen in the strong countries. And it's an easy way to do. You simply shift the agenda of political discourse to other countries. And then there will be no space for my country's not so nice things. Now I want some little interaction. I am really interested in your views about all these three issues. Geneva is far away. No enforcement mechanism exists for um, implementing the recommendations. And uh, actually, this entire international human rights monitoring is dictated by political, international political considerations. Uh, you may share these concerns. To, to much extent, I myself as an individual, share many of them. But now I would be interested in your views, how we can counteract these concerns. How could we make sure that, yes, Geneva can be far away, but it does not necessarily mean that they don't know what happens in my place, and doesn't mean that I can't know what they are doing. What can we do to ensure that this is not the case? Or, how can we push our governments to really implement their obligations, the recommendations coming from uh, the committee, whatever treaty body of the United Nations? And what do you think about this allegation that uh, this entire international human rights is only about politics? We spent, say, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, uh, uh, as program officer of the Disability Rights Fund, I totally understand this concern. And I think that one of the most important things that is missing is funding for DPOs, for disabled people organizations, to really participate in monitoring mechanisms. There is a, a systemic lack of um, economical resources organizations to really get involved, for people with disabilities to really say, okay, this is alternative reporting, uh -huh, and we are going to, uh, to do the follow-up of the, of the concluding observations, which might take years. Mm -hmm. These are very, very long processes, and are, in general, uh, working with very, very little resources. And Geneva is, more than far away, is very expensive, too. Uh -huh. I mean, part of this being far away is 
who, are, who is going to go to Geneva to present a 10 minute um, 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 presentation no? a, 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 a presentation of the rights of people with this multi similar conflict. So th th this is the things that we, uh, that, that we can fault, for example, no? the Disability Rights Fund uh, has identified and I totally agree with you, no? but in general terms, what I think is that it might be necessary to to create mechanisms to ensure that alternative reporting will be available for all countries. Yes, I think the key word for me from uh, your intervention is alternative reporting. And let's focus on, on the opportunities. Yes, resources is, is a very difficult issue. But alternative reports may play, and actually so far have played a very important role in, in the CRPD committee's uh, uh, work. I have to tell you that uh, in the case of some countries, we did not really have alternative reports. And it was primarily not a funding issue. Simply in the country, no DPOs existed. Um, and then International Disability Alliance tried to help a little bit. They sent missions to those countries. They met individuals and informal small disability groups, exchanged uh, with them, and tried to collect information. This cannot replace or substitute for uh, a genuine alternative report. Uh, which really gives an account of a large number of persons with disabilities living in a country, but at least we had some alternative independent source of information besides the government report. And without that sort of an information, the committee could come up only with some very generic recommendations making really no sense. But alternative reporting can make the recommendations really, really useful. Who else would like to? address some of these issues. Uh, thank you very much. Um, maybe I'd like to bring forward um, a, good ex a good example from the Netherlands uh, with regards to the CEDAW committee. Um, there's been a political case in the Netherlands where there's a political party who does not allow women to even become members of this political party. It's based on, on religious conviction. Um, in the alternative report to CEDAW committee, the Dutch uh, alternative report mentioned this. The CEDAW committee made a, um, a concluding observation in this regard. And this was used as a basis to start strategic litigation. And in the end, the Supreme Court of the Netherlands um, told this, that this was a violation of women's rights. And this party should have allowed or should allow um, uh, women to become members of the of the committee. So, without the concluding observations by the CEDAW committee, it would have been very difficult to bring this case forward. Even the Supreme Court, in its uh, in its judgment, mentioned the uh, the concluding observations. Thank you. It's always good to hear some success stories when the treaty body work results in some real change. Yes. For me, is if you make condition F, the system change cannot possible. I can answer this one on I'm like citizen. I think the first step to identify, to break the concealment of the control outcome, especially in the in the issue of related to torture, cruel, inhuman, degrade treatment. Who the one who establishment the fact? Who the one who interpret. If you can control outcome, any kind of tools, very difficult. Sometimes basic things cannot solve with basic things. If you depend on the money, oh sorry, the, the financing, it's too more complicated. Who's your hat? Sometimes have many hat. So the, the, the question of bias, even though the research, the data analysis on act on how we have. So I'm a system, I have direct experience. I have dual concept of the system. So, but I believe in democracy. I will talk on my own behalf, and I want to prove by the fact, not by people who interpret, that is 
my solution without cost because we have with this invisible chain of slavery. It doesn't mean change. Sorry, yeah, this is my solution. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Our experience, Geneva is very far, but uh, for us uh, as a national human rights institution and the accreditation that we got from uh, the Office of High Commission, the Human Rights Council, is that uh, we have opportunities to present alternative reports. And of course, because of our approach that we use, uh, we use a very approach that involves all actors. Like our UPR process, we have a coalition of all actors. So what we do when we get the concluding observations, we convene all the actors, including uh, the DPOs, and uh, including the women organization, because our, cluster, our report is normally in a cluster, in a thematic way, and each theme is given to a different actor to do it. So when you go for reviews, when we get the recommendations, because it's a state obligation, we sit down with the different offices from the, from the government, and we draw a strategy of, by the, the next four years we are coming up for review, this is what you have to achieve as, an, as, a, as a department of the state. And in addition to that, we do a monitoring of how far each department has implemented this. And if the department is slow in implementation, we do advisory to the, to the parliament to make sure that now they call upon the various departments to make sure that uh, they, they enforce or they implement their recommendations. So what I'm trying to say is that for the NHRIs which are here and you have that mandate, it's very good that you don't just have it on your, on your office, but you bring along all the actors because that's how we have operated and that's how we have ensured that uh, each, each organization understands the recommendations that comes from Geneva, which is very far, and that when we go to present our statement, we have the statement of an NHRI and you have the statement of non-status uh, non actors in the same place. And uh, with regard to the rural people understanding the, what the whole process of recommend, uh, monitoring is, we were actually talking about it and we said that Unlike the fact that it's the state's obligation, I think also the citizens need to understand the whole process so that they can also question the government because it's not just the role of NHRI that should question the government, but the citizens too have a role to question the government. So we were saying that we will try and pilot a project where we have to constitute uh, the, the organizations within the grassroots and see whether they can really understand what the whole process is all about. And that's starting with a training for the DPOs to also be able to understand how to write shadow, report shadow reports to the various committees. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, the last one from, from the OHCHR. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, I mean, you, you all know that we follow up very closely on, on these processes from, from the FCSI because we, we, promote, uh, we provide uh, secretariat services to, to the committee. Um, and um, for me, it's all about really the synergies that you manage to create um, and whether there's political will or not. Um, we've seen very bad examples, uh, of which Gabor knows that Hungary is, is a very uh, sad example on, on lack of political will, uh, but then again, Peru, uh, which is super far away from Geneva, is a really good example on, on how things have moved very well forward uh, on the basis of the concluding observations of the committee and the dialogue, starting from how DPOs were trained before and parallel reporting, etc., and and the Disability Council working together with, with parts of the government and DPOs and, and also with our support, our technical support from, from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to the dialogue itself to now follow up or actually the, the concluding observations are used as the basis for, for um, revising uh, their, action, their National Action Plan on Disability um, and, and revising a whole set of laws right now in, at the national and local levels in Peru. So this is a really empowering example example that, that we um, that I myself like to bring up as, as, as something that, that you know things can work <laughs> although Geneva is far away um, if you if, if the right components are there political will and, and really joint work among all of the all of the stakeholders uh, 
I'll just take this opportunity now that we're talking about monitoring to say that I just received a news from Geneva saying that a new special rapporteur on, on disability will be, uh, will be appointed by the Human Rights Council. So this is very good news uh, in terms of monitoring of, of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think you have telepathic skills because uh, I wanted to use Peru as an example myself. So thank you for uh, doing that. Um, my very brief answers to these concerns would be like, Geneva is far away, yes. Uh, we heard that it does not necessarily mean too much. And I have to tell you that uh, the CRPD committee has been very open and flexible in using other channels of communication with uh, uh, even informal groups of persons with disabilities about whom we knew that they have no way to get to Geneva to share their experiences and knowledge to inform the committee, but the committee felt that they can report about really grave and systemic issues. So a very bad quality Skype meeting was arranged between some of the committee members and some members of that informal group from a country which is not at the stage of democratic infrastructures where it's easy, you know, even for a national human rights institution to uh, coordinate cooperation between DPOs and the government. So it is possible. You have to be insistent. You have to have the knowledge that there is a committee in Geneva, of course. But if you do have that and if you know something which is really important and serious, then the barriers can be overcome. No enforcement mechanism for the recommendations. And I read it in conjunction with the third one that in the end of the game, this is just an international political game. And for us, human rights violations is not an international political game. It's my life. Uh, I am just raising an option. Yes, this political nature is very much there. The first question I am raising, is politics necessarily a wrong thing? And what I submit, and we will come back to this a little bit later, that no. Politics, say in the sense Aristotle understood it, is a very noble thing. And every person is political. Aristotle said that a human being is a political animal. Politicization is something which can be very wrong. I use the term politicization with the meaning that politics by a very powerful group is abused. And instead, instead of working for the good of the entire community, they play out one group against the other to ensure that they gain even more power. Now, this politicization is a negative thing, but being political is not. It's a natural thing. It comes from the fact that we are human beings and we live in communities. Our work, our everyday work, let us be human rights defenders at the grassroots level, colleagues from national human rights institutions, law professors, whoever who are here in this room, uh, we do politics when we are fighting for and working for uh, the human rights of persons with disabilities. So can we possibly use, instead of being victims of the international politicization of human rights issues? Some of you, I think, Miriam, you mentioned the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, which is a highly politicizable uh, mechanism in the human rights system, but a highly effective mechanism also, when we come to that, then I will try to convince you that if we are smart enough, then that serves a very good forum to use the politicized nature of the process instead of becoming victims of them. And we can make politics in the Aristotelian sense from the politicization which came from other considerations. 
So now uh, I will turn to the main part of my presentation. How can we maximally use the system? And then we will look at briefly what the system is. I would say that the weaknesses of the treaty body system as it is now will dominate if the treaty bodies are left alone by who? By us. I use the term civil society, but civil society covers everyone. I mean, everyone as an individual, everyone as a group also belongs to the civil society. Even politicians, even government representatives, when they are not in their governmental role, they are also part of civil society. And the CRPD is very explicit on that. If you look at the preamble, then you will see that basically everyone, everyone has some duties coming from the CRPD. Very often what I experience is that uh, colleagues in DPOs uh, and NGOs expect that the treaty bodies will do everything. It is their mandate to monitor and bring about the change. Now I am saying that yes, Geneva is far away. How on earth could they bring about the change in Budapest? or Kuala Lumpur, or Beijing. It's not possible. It's not their mandate. Their mandate is very, very limited. And we have to be very much aware of that. But it's a limited mandate, but not meaningless. It simply means that they can do something. And if there are no synergies, if there are no other active, and I would even say proactive stakeholders, then that limited thing will have no result. It's not a surprise. But that can be used if civil society is also actively and proactively there. Uh, if we are only criticizing the treaty bodies, which is not that difficult to do, then who will make sure, who will help to change the system. Some of you might have heard about the long and ongoing process of treaty body reforms in the United Nations. Because the United Nations is very much aware of all the shortcomings of the existing system. If these reforms are left only on governments, then again, what we will see is that it will become an international political, politicized political game, and uh, the outcome is uncertain. If civil society engages with the treaty bodies, engages with the system, then I think we have some opportunity and chance that the reform will come into the good direction. And I already mentioned this question, can we use politicization to do politics? So now I'm asking just one question. Please, those of you who have ever done anything which relates to the work of treaty bodies, say, writing a shadow report, submitting proposals for recommendations uh, to the committee, attending a meeting by a treaty body, watching a webcast of a treaty body meeting, any, any interaction with any of the treaty bodies, please raise your hands. It's not bad. It's pretty good. Uh, the major and primary mandate of the treaty bodies is to do the country reviews. And this activity happens in the so-called monitoring cycle. And I wanted to have the diagram here and I failed to copy and paste the diagram. So now you learn another weakness of mine. I can't draw, but I will try. It is a cycle which has a beginning and has no end, hopefully. The beginning is that uh, a country ratifies a treaty. It enters into force, and then after some time, in the case of CRPD, two years after the entry into force, 
the state party has to submit its so-called initial report. And then there is a period of the cycle after which, and in the case of CRPD it is four years, after every four years from then on, they have to submit their next periodic review, a periodic report. So there is a submission of report. Uh, who has experience about submitting state report? Who worked close to the government enough to see how it works? Yes? Can we have a microphone there? Briefly sharing your experience, how it worked. There, 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 there. Uh, please raise your hands. <laughs> I used to work in, in I'm from Finland, uh, so before my, my time with the Office of Management and Human Rights, and, and I work with an NGO in Finland with Plan International Finland's um, um, office, and um, and with, to the CRC, the Committee on the Rights of, of Children, uh, Finland has a way in which they. They, they produce only one report, uh, so one state report in which NGOs participate in the drafting of that report. And, and um, so we did that because that's the only way as NGOs that we could actually influence the process. But we didn't really like it because uh, the alternative report really has its own weight and its own um, function as, on, as a parallel to the state report. But yeah, I, I, I worked on on the government's CRC report uh, or periodic report to the CRC, but from an NGO perspective. Thank you. Uh, at the last row, please. Uh, good morning, I'm Helen Potts from the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, when the uh, report for the uh, state report for the committee, UN Committee on the um, Rights of Persons with Disabilities was being prepared. The government forwarded us a copy of it, not so much to, it's more to, to superficially but, but importantly comment on it in the sense of the request was not to add to it so much but do we have anything wrong in here? Have we actually missed something that needs to go in? So we worked on it from that point of view, but with respect to the Human Rights Institution, we submitted our own information at the request of the committee. And we didn't um, input into the civil society report, but we worked closely around that. So, you know, we knew what was going on in the civil society report as well. Rosemary might like to add some more to that, I don't know. Thank you, Amita. Well, we had uh, this experience after the government of India kind of asked us to do the first draft, or you can say the... the asked the, you, who is the you? Uh, the asked the Center for Disability Studies, National, Nalsar Hyderabad, to draft the uh, country report um, for uh, the government of India. But evidently, the final approval was to be with the government of India. And uh, we, we had this... Uh, I, would, I suppose uh, I would use the neutral term interesting experience of uh, that whilst we followed the mandate of the committee in trying to do a stock taking and uh, blueprinting on where the country stood, uh, the government itself was not very comfortable with this honest kind of audit of its strengths and weaknesses and is more uh, inclined to make it a only strengths report. They also were not so comfortable about blueprinting in the sense of making you know, specific commitments that this is what they would do. They said, of course, we would do it, but we do not want this to be in an international report. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, what we heard is really uh, shared by many of us who had an opportunity to, to do something around reporting and have some sort of an interaction with the governments also. Uh, and I would say that especially with the CRPD, the situation is really, really delicate. 
if you look at what the CRPD requires in general, and also regarding the, the, the monitoring obligations, uh, preparing the report, the government should closely consult with and work together with uh, persons with disabilities through their representative organizations. Which means that the government report itself, in theory, if the government really wants to comply with their obligations under the CRPD, should involve input from uh, the DPOs and civil society at large, which I think is great. But we also heard from, from your real life experiences that it has some difficulties, some constraints. The ultimate decision maker is the ultimate reporter, the government, and that's understandable. It simply means that uh, DPOs and civil society has to learn how to be in different roles, advising our government while being prepared that they will not necessarily take what we advise and being able to independently report in our respective alternative reports as well. And that can be a little bit difficult uh, and I think we have to, to learn how to do that. And I think that national human rights institutions can be in a really interesting situation because somewhere they are in between civil society and the government and they can uh, if they are real allies to the DPO movement, play a very interesting mediator role or facilitator role in, in, uh, in the entire process. So the state submits the report. Uh, there is a possibility for alternative reporting. And I would say it's not only a possibility. Treaty bodies desperately need independent information. What happens next? The committee receives the report. Of course, it goes to the shelves. It's waiting because there is a long, long, long waiting time. Huge backlog, especially with the CRPD committee. Hopefully, it will change for the better. But when the committee starts to deal with these uh, reports, both the state report and all the alternative information, they produce a so-called list of issues. The list of issues is a number, a limited number of questions, not too many questions. Questions on which the committee is uncertain, but the issue is important. For instance, issues on which there is a contradiction between what the government says and the alternative sources of information say. Or issues on which the government is silent, but the alternative report contains something. Or any other controversies. So the committee adopts those list of questions, and again at this stage there is a possibility to have an input to that. Civil society, independent experts, if possible in a coordinated way, not hundreds of separate DPOs and experts separately but jointly and together, can submit recommendations to the committee what questions, in their opinion, the committee should include in the list of issues. And I have to tell you that I would say from half to two-thirds of the questions in the CRPD committee's list of issues actually come from DPO and other independent recommendations. What happens after that? The list of issues are answered by the government in writing. I think so far all the governments submitted written <coughs> responses to the questions. Not very early though, typically in the last week, at best two weeks before the real hearing takes place. 
which means that again, civil society and independent experts need to follow up and look into what the government is doing, where they are in their answering, but sometimes it doesn't help too much because if there is a very long delay in the government's answers, then it may be better not waiting for uh, them. Regardless of them, the independent sources can give their answers to the list of issues questions. And then the committee still will be in the position to compare the answers, what the government answers to that question and what the independent sources answer to the questions. <clears throat> so again, at this stage, uh, civil society, especially DPOs, have a good opportunity to have an input. And you don't have to go to Geneva for that. That's important. Yes, resources are important, but I would say resources are primarily important for doing your job in your own country. You don't necessarily have to travel. It's a good thing to travel, and personal uh, contact is always very useful and important, but not absolutely necessary. So then, the physical meeting takes place in Geneva. It is good if you can be there, but again, I emphasize it's not absolutely crucial. Uh, this physical meeting is called the constructive dialogue. It's, it's a UN language, but we believe in it. We really believe in it in the UN. Uh, the committee asks questions in a constructive manner, and we expect that the governments give constructive answers. Now, if the governments are cooperative, then it becomes a real constructive. Not that much dialogue, though, because typically it is that the committee asks questions and the government answers. Also, I have to tell you that some governments entered into a real dialogue. They asked questions from the committee also. And it was very welcome by the committee. Uh, what opportunities for civil society and other independent uh, experts are there around the constructive dialogue? Again, the committee can meet representatives of DPOs last minute information before the constructive dialogue takes place. If you cannot afford going there, you can submit your communication in uh, other, other sources as well. You can simply send emails, last minute information, and my experience is that it will reach the committee and it will be taken as much into consideration by the committee members as those informations which were uh, directly and physically communicated there. What is the outcome of the constructive dialogue? The outcome is the concluding observation. Which is basically a list of concerns uh, plus the recommendations how to fix those concerns. The good recommendations, in my opinion, uh, are free from two extreme mistakes. One extreme mistake is that uh, the recommendation is too generic. You have to improve the right to vote for persons with disabilities. Okay, it's not too helpful. The government will not know what to do better. Yes, they may agree, we should, but what on earth shall we do? But it cannot be overly prescriptive either. Uh, if the committee says that the government needs to change paragraph 3 of the law of 1997 on this and that, the government will not take it seriously because it is the government who was mandated in the elections to be responsible to manage the legislative efforts in the country through writing legislative proposals which then go to the legislature, etc., etc. It is not the mandate of the treaty body. So finding something which is in between, which is not overly 
generic, but not overly prescriptive, is something which I call good recommendations. The committee does not have the local knowledge. The committee knows very little about the domestic legislation, the, the, the little pieces, you know, the details in which the devil exists. Uh, if there is someone in the committee from the country which is reviewed, that person is not taking place in the review because there will be a conflict of interest. So the committee, without very important input from, again, DPOs and other civil society experts, could be only in the position to give generic recommendations. So again, it's really important that the concluding observations are informed well by the uh, independent sources of information as well. How can it be done? Again, when the constructive dialogue takes place, you can watch it, even if you are not in Geneva. An increasing number of the treaty body meetings are live webcast, and then they are also archived, so they can be watched later on also. Uh, all the CRPD uh, constructive uh, dialogues are live webcast and later on archived. So you can watch it if you have an internet access. And uh, from the constructive dialogue, you can guess, you know, what in your opinion would be important to be included among the recommendations. But you may know it well in advance. So some alternative reports actually and each chapter with some recommendations. And they mean that those recommendations can be considered by the committee uh, to be included in the concluding observations. And then, this is the end of the cycle for the committee. But I would say it is pretty much the beginning of the work for all in your country who are concerned. You have to implement the recommendations, you have to make follow-up, etc., etc., etc. And then, after four years, another reporting cycle will start. So you can really see from this diagram that what I said makes sense. If the committee is left alone by civil society, then we can't expect too much. Then the weaknesses of the system will dominate. So I summarized the possibilities and perils of reporting on this uh, slide. The possibilities include stock taking. It's a very good opportunity to take stock, to know where we are. Uh, I think many of us who have already gone through our country's review experience that, hey, before this country review, we did not know really much on the systemic level about the real situation of persons with disabilities in my country. Not in a holistic manner. We might have known something about basic statistics. We might have known something about employment issues. But a comprehensive holistic picture about how the rights of persons with disabilities are actually accessible for real people with disabilities on the real ground, we knew very little. Because in most countries, such a work had never been done. So it's a real opportunity for stock taking. It makes data which you can use in your future advocacy. I always say, colleagues, and before I joined the committee, before I was elected to the committee, I had the opportunity to coordinate the Hungarian shadow reporting, alternative reporting process. And from the very beginning, my position was that the work is not primarily done for Geneva. Geneva is important. It gives me an opportunity to do the things here. The advocacy will be done here. Geneva is just one stop, which is a little bit outside but in the spotlight to some extent. But it is for my country, it is for my community. 
And because I have to make a real stock taking, I have to collect also some basic data or other indicators to evidentiate what I am saying in the report. This gives us an evidence base for my domestic advocacy work. And then again, this Geneva is far away is not a real issue. I am not working for Geneva. I am working for my own place. And it allows for a systemic planning. I get a picture. I see not only a particular issue, say employment of persons with disabilities. In most national agendas, in some period, there are some priority areas. Employment, education. And then you have no idea how many persons with disabilities are in prisons. You have no idea about how many uh, people with disabilities have basic issues about accessing social security. And a person's life is not compartmentalized into, oh, this, this part of me is social security. This part of me is employment. No, I am one person. And I am facing enormous difficulties if I can access certain services, but nothing else is available for me. Uh, and this holistic and evidence-based uh, framework, which ideally comes out as a result of the monitoring, is something we need for a systemic planning, which is uh, leading us to the blueprinting. Planned change can be made. And again in this, the concluding observation recommendations can be enormously useful. Uh, can be enormously useful. I told you that a good recommendation, in my opinion, is not overly generic, but not overly prescriptive. And it has another uh, characteristic also. It is implementable in four years. The committee and our committee took it seriously, should come up with recommendations which can be, how to say, implemented in four years. Because when the government, or maybe a new government from the country, will come back four years later, the committee must be in the position to ask, what did you do? And actually, that is what the country primarily has to report about in their first periodic review. They are accountable for what they do with the recommendations. If the recommendation is something which cannot be implemented in 20 years, then the government's answer will be, we are making a good effort. But we are not there yet. And it doesn't give us too much. But if it is really something which can be done in four years, then the situation is different. So uh, these recommendations are not about an indefinite plan. It is about a time-bound plan. What are the perils of reporting? Whitewashing. Well, if school kids are requested to evaluate their progress, and that's the only evaluation, then most kids will whitewash themselves. They will speak about the good things only. And it's very bad because it invisibilizes reality, it promotes deception skills, and it makes truth searching an end in itself. And instead of blueprinting, it helps maintain the status quo, which creates vested interest in no change. And again, I would say that every human being and every group of human beings, if they are left alone, they are inclined to go for this perils side. What can help to benefit more from the possibilities than from the perils? The very same things we have uh, been talking about so far. You, we as civil society, DPOs, or whoever we are, we must have our contribution made to the process. And we must be watchdogs of what our governments do with their reporting. And we have to be able to contribute to providing independent information as well. Uh, the primary mandate of the treaty bodies is this country review, which is mandated by the treaty itself. Now, 
under several treaties, including the CRPD, there is or there are optional protocols which give additional mandates to the treaty body. In case of the optional protocol to the CRPD, one of these additional mandates is the inquiry procedure. The inquiry procedure is basically about grave and systemic violations of human rights in a country. There, the issue has been raised and the government did not really make effective uh, actions to fix the situation. It is a very high threshold uh, thing. The violation should really be grave and really systemic. And it cannot be based on a gossip. An inquiry procedure against the country has a very, very high profile internationally also. It should be established. And the procedure is highly confidential uh, until the outcome, the end of the procedure. The committee has not completed an inquiry procedure yet. But the committee started its first inquiry procedure against the United Kingdom. I wanted to share this with you. This is a public piece of information. Nothing else about the inquiry procedure is public. Okay? So we only know that the United Kingdom has the privilege to be made accountable through the inquiry procedure by the CRPD committee regarding grave and systemic violations of persons with disabilities in the United Kingdom. We will see, I am really curious what uh, will happen and what this inquiry procedure is about. Again, civil society does play an enormous role in this. Typically an inquiry procedure is initiated by civil society organizations. It's a highly confidential procedure, as I told you, uh, and it's a very dynamic procedure. The treaty body can delegate some of its members uh, who visit the country and meet NGOs, uh, meet governments, and enters into a dialogue with them. The optional protocol also allows for individual communications. Individual communications are complaints, using plain language. If someone lives in a country uh, which is party to the optional protocol and uh, uh, alleges that uh, one or more of his or her rights under the convention itself have been violated and exhausted all available domestic remedies, uh, and <clears throat> did not succeed, then can uh, submit an individual communication. The committee has dealt with several individual communications so far. Uh, the outcome of this procedure is not a judgment or decision because the treaty body is not a court. Uh, it is called the views of the committee. Nevertheless, I think they are quite important. What are the advantages of the individual communication? For those of you who come from Europe and from countries which ratify the optional protocol, it can be a realistic question. You have a client who exhausted domestic remedies, did not succeed. Will you go to Strasbourg, to the Human Rights Court, which is a court, they issue a judgment? Or will you go to the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Let us spend, say, five minutes on this question. What do you think? Try to argue in favor of one or the other, briefly. Who would like to start?
Thanks very much. Um, I'm Duncan from the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, I suppose it depends very much on what the, the subject of the complaint is. So, for example, if it relates to, let's say, a classic civil and political rights violation, they might be tempted to go to Strasbourg because of the uh, enforcement mechanisms, the political structures that in, uh, force the execution of, of judgments. Um, but again, uh, you just to speed up, may I immediately uh, interrupt you interacting with you? Go ahead. Uh, in Hungary, we had the Kish versus Hungary case about the classical political right, right to vote. Um, and it took many years for a so-called implementation on which the UN committee found that even that is not compliant with the CRPD. I am aware of several cases from Russia. Uh, which are even longer than this Kish case, and again they are about liberty and uh, other classic civil political rights, and nothing has been changed. Yes, it's a court, it's a judgment, there are enforcement mechanisms, but they do not enforce. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, uh, and, and no system is perfect, and, and I think you've outlined many ways in which the UN treaty body system is imperfect also. Um, but, but what I was going on to say was that um, even there, uh, there might be limitations in the way in which the court uh, addresses um, the rights of disabled people in, uh, under the convention. Now, it increasingly refers to the CRPD in its judgments, and the case that you outlined and many others do make reference to the CRPD, but they may have a more limited interpretation of its provisions in the committee, and I think that, that, that seems to be the case from um, the committee's view on Article 12 uh, in comparison with um, a series of cases from, from Strasbourg. Um, secondly, the, convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, of course, only relates to um, a, a, a large number of civil and political rights, but not to economic, social, and cultural, or indeed the sort of hybrid rights that you see in the CRPD. So there's a whole series of cases that you couldn't really contemplate taking to Strasbourg, or if you did, they would be looked at from a very narrow and partial perspective. Um, so, and, and, it, and it also depends what country you're, you're coming from, because some countries like the Netherlands, which was referred to before, have tended to view views uh, related to individual communications under optional protocols of other conventions as effectively if not actually binding. So they take them very seriously. Whereas other countries, like my own, the United Kingdom, uh, has very little experience of individual petitions mechanisms and doesn't tend to see them as, as binding in any way. Thank you very much. I think that you have said everything which was in my mind. Uh, let us go on because we are running out of time. We are not far from the ending. Uh, but I really wanted to briefly address that uh, the CRPD committee shall never be left in isolation. And we always learn, you know, that uh, human rights are universal, indivisible, interrelated, etc. But if you, if, you, if you really go into this international and regional human rights world, what you learn from the everyday working is that it is everything but universal indivisible, interrelated. We are talking about right to liberty. Yes, right to liberty under what? Under CRPD, under ICCPR, under the European Convention. And if you look at the jurisprudences, well, let us stay just with the UN system. Right to vote. <clears throat> the CRPD committee was very clear in concluding observations in individual communication views. No person with disability shall ever be deprived of their right to vote, either automatically or based on an individual assessment based on their disability. Look at what the Human Rights Committee, which monitors the ICCPR, says about the same thing. They don't say the same. The right to liberty. What you can find in the concluding observations by the CRPD committee and also in the general comment number one, which is on Article 12, but makes a link between Article 12 and Article 14 and clearly says that psychiatric treatment 
without free and informed consent of the person, him or herself, is in violation to the CRPD, right? What does the Human Rights Committee say about the same issue? Absolutely different. What, what, it's obviously not about universality and whatever, whatever, whatever. But it should be made universal and interdependent and interrelated. Unfortunately, there is a tension built in the system. It is very important that the treaty bodies are as independent as possible. Both the members of the treaty bodies, they should be independent from their government interests, independent from whatever. They should be accountable only to their own uh, expertise, if you like, and their own expert opinion. Uh, and it's not only about the individual members of the committee, the committees themselves need to be autonomous. They should not depend even on the United Nations, if you like. But it creates this tension that, yes, independence sometimes contradicts to cooperation. And cooperation would be very important if you really want to ensure that the different treaty bodies say the same thing on the same question. When this right to vote issue was very much on our agenda, and also on the Human Rights Committee's agenda, the chair of our committee started to initiate some informal consultations with the Human Rights Committee. It was not very successful. And then International Disability Alliance held a side event during the uh, session of the Human Rights Committee in New York. I was invited as a member of the panel, not as a CRPD committee member, in my individual capacity. But during the time when I was a member of the CRPD committee, this created somewhat pressure between the two committees, which was very positive, because that really pressured the two committees to make links and start real informal discussions on the issue. So again, an example that without civil society's contribution, something would be very difficult if it is left only on the UN machinery. And it's not because anybody is wrong. It is simply because uh, there is this built intention between being autonomous and independent and at the same time being very interactive with other uh, bodies. Uh, and again, civil society can be very effective if, for instance, you have a good alternative report under the CRPD. Then almost it is only a, an issue of copy and paste to copy and paste some of the paragraphs of your alternative report in the into the corresponding alternative report to the CRC committee, if it is about children with disabilities, or the, the, the um, I'm getting tired, or the torture committee, or the ICCPR, or the ISSCAR committee. So in one shadow report, actually, you will have a number of contributions to a number. And it is really important because civil society is best placed to mainstream the rights of persons with disabilities and the works of the CRPD committee into the other bodies as well. Uh, the UPR was mentioned by Miriam, Universal Periodic Review. It is not a treaty-based monitoring. Uh, it is a charter, the UN charter-based monitoring. It is not an expert review, it is a peer review, countries review countries. From this it comes that it is inherently political, it's a real international political game with a huge potential to be politicized. Nevertheless, it is a very high profile event. It is in the spotlight. It is a very concise, very short thing compared to treaty body reports and monitoring. It is less fearful for the governments because not independent experts look at us, but other countries, our peers, either friends or enemies, but in the end of the day, any one of us have something in the, some uh, uh, skeletons in the cupboard. It's not that fearful. 
And the game is there. Every country has allies and enemies. And you have to play with that. And they are playing with it. But we can also play with it when we do our contribution. Again, shadow reporting, alternative reporting is possible, very limited, very uh, short uh, size uh, reports. Uh, there is a consultation in most countries before the government report is submitted, as Miriam also uh, described. Uh, fora are created, and civil society, including DPOs, can contribute. And uh, you can also seek for countries who you know are supportive on your issues. There are some countries who take the rights of persons with disabilities very seriously in the UN. You can make contact with them prior to the universal periodic review of your country. You can lobby with them, and you have a good chance that they will take it into consideration. So countries are seeking for allies. We can also seek for allies. We, uh, this is how I think we can make politics in the Aristotelian sense from politicization. And it's, it, the UPR has a huge discourse potential exactly because it's a high-profile political issue which can be easily politicized, so it is very ready for gossiping in the media. Uh, it's perfect. It's perfect for this course. And we do know, and we heard from previous lectures here, that this course is a very good thing to promote changes in the culture. The very last uh, slide is basically the summary. Uh, how can we make monitoring meaningful with the use of treaty body monitoring, including the CRPD committee? Civil society should critique uh, the system with the view of reforming it and not rejecting it because it's problematic. Uh, we have to let the threat to be the opportunity, and it's possible. We saw several examples for that. Let the enforcement produce compliance, and we saw that enforcement is possible, although formally there are no enforcement tools in the system. Conformity expectations obtain conformity. You know, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it, it does work if we do our contribution to the process. Monitoring is an articulation of international expectations. That's also important, you know. If your country knows that what they do or don't do is part of an international expectation, then it crosses borders. And it's more difficult to halt it. And it's very important that our failures shall never cause us to stop striving. So do not give up if after one cycle of reporting, you do not achieve what you wanted. Look at those things, what you achieved. And learn from why you achieved what you did and what you should still do to achieve those ones which you failed. Thank you very much. but also to distill it down into the core components, that it is really a domestic situation that you're talking about that has an international context. Whilst the standards are set by the community of nations, it is really the actions within the domestic framework that develop the change. And so the voice of people with disability, both within the domestic arena, but the opportunities that are available on the international stage are very, very important. But it's to sit back and to see that in a way where you see all the pieces and understand the strengths, the challenges and the opportunities, but not to develop a cynical, well, it's all not worth it, but that it can achieve if we engage, if we participate, and if we keep the reality check that it's what we do 
as individuals and how we engage, that can generate change. The treaty body's not going to do it for us. We need to engage with them. So thank you very much, Gabor. I was um, an excellent hour and a half. It went like that. And uh, thank you so much. If we can reconvene at 11.20, we have um, some colleagues from the United Kingdom and um, talking, bringing us back again to monitoring the CRPD. And uh, I look forward to sharing that session with you after a cup of tea. Mm -hmm.